We're back. We're talking about leaving a legacy. And we'll be talking about this for a while yet. Uh, I think we're now in our third week here of leaving a legacy. Last week on Mother's Day was, was the mothers leaving a legacy. And this week we're going to talk about uh, being a church and leaving a legacy as a church. And, and as you look at the church, the church of Jesus Christ represents the greatest hope for the world. And the reason for that, of course, is because the church has both the ability, the church has the resources, and the church has the gifting by God to bring kingdom values into our world, into a world that has largely, I think, lost its way. And so, as I said, we're continuing on this series of leaving a legacy, and today we're going to talk about leaving a legacy as a church. And there's just one verse today that I'm going to ask you to turn to. I'll reference a number of other ones, but there's one that I want you to read. There's one that I want you to check out. And and that verse, as you see on the screen, is Acts 20, 28. If you've got a Bible, you're welcome to look it up. There's some in the pews. You can flip it open on your iPhone or your Android or whatever you've got. But it's Acts 20, 22. And it's in that that the Apostle Paul is saying goodbye uh, to the elders at the church of Ephesus, this church that Paul had a tremendous relationship with. If, If we could say Paul had a favorite church, I would bet that it was the church at Ephesus. And, and so Paul is saying goodbye to the elders at the church in Ephesus here in Acts 20, 28. And, and he says these parting words. Paul says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained or purchased with his own blood. I love that passage of scripture, right? I mean, we know, we know God the Father himself doesn't have blood, but the Apostle Paul is so convinced in the deity of Jesus Christ that Jesus is indeed God, uh, that because of that, he can speak of the church as having been purchased by the blood of God. And if that is the case, then, can you imagine just how special the church is to God. Think of that price. Jesus paid the price. Purchased purchased at an incredibly high cost, right? With his life. And then we know Jesus, of course, makes the statement. He says that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, right? So he's paid the price and he will build the church. But we can't just then say, okay, well, Jesus paid the price. Jesus is going to build his church. So we can set it on cruise control, right? And just let God take care of everything, right? We we, we can't say that as believers. We can't just put the church on autopilot and say, here, Jesus, take the wheel, right? You know that song? Anybody else listen to country? Nobody wants to admit that, right? (laughs) But we can't do that. But I think... Sadly, in some cases, we, the church of the world, have done that very thing. Or or at least that it's happening, at the very least. I know for sure that it's already happened in Europe, right? A couple of generations ago, in fact, uh, Europe began to move away from the Bible. Move away from placing any importance upon the church. If you know anything about the church in Europe, you know that that the church in Europe basically serves three purposes at three different times in the life of most of the people in Europe. The church is there when they hatch, when they match, and when they dispatch, right? When they're born, when they're married, and when they die. Other than that, the church is largely irrelevant in most of their lives, or at least they feel it is. Much of Europe does. They don't have an active participation Europe is what we would call post-Christian. They are past, beyond Christian. And it would appear, frighteningly, that slowly but surely some of that begins to creep its way across the ocean and into America today. And and, and I think, sadly, uh, we as a nation, if we're not careful, are in jeopardy of becoming a little bit like Europe, or maybe a lot. See, according to statisticians, each and every year in America, 4,000 churches close their doors never to open again. That's that's a terrible statistic. And that's 
at the low range. Some years it's many more. The good news is, of course, that we are starting more churches, right? And, and, and the great news is we, us, we're part of a denomination called Converge. It used to be the Baptist General Conference. Before that, it was the Swedish Baptist, right? We are part of an organization, a denomination that has prioritized starting new churches. So, so we're, char- we're, 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 we're among the best in the world, in fact. And that's not to brag. That's just a statistical fact. We are among the best in the world at starting new churches. Uh, but the problem is we're not keeping up. Yes, we are growing as Converge. And there's a few other organizations and denominations that are growing. Most of them, though, losing people. Some of them by the millions. And so it's a a definite concern. It's a thing of worry. Because it would appear that the church is losing some of its effectiveness. That, uh, that I guess, people aren't listening to us as much as they once did anymore, right? Well, why is this, of course? We've got to ask that question. Why, why is this happening? Well, I think there's a, a number of reasons, several forces that contribute to this. And, and I think some of them are internal problems that we as the church need to be very specific about addressing and taking care of. One, one clear example that I think is a problem in many, many churches, I've seen this firsthand, I've been part of more than one church, folks, but one of the, one of the problems that I've seen in a number of places, and, and you've probably experienced it too, is a thing that I'll call selfism. See, selfism is the idea that it's all about me, right? You ever read Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life? Very first sentence, it's not about you. Okay, sorry to spoil your day if you came here thinking it was, but it's not about me. And this, 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 this attitude, this almost culture at times of selfism is this idea, whether we express it intentionally and verbally or not, but it's this idea that I really don't care about anyone else. I mean, we've always done it that way, right? It's, 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 it's about me. I paid for that, I gave that, I did that, I built that, I whatever that. And I'm going to make a lot of noise now if I don't get my way, right? I'm going to throw an adult temper tantrum because you didn't do it like I thought you should do it. It's a problem. And this is one of the, the biggest distractions, in fact, to churches, it's one of the, the, the greatest blights on the advancement of the gospel. I want to be frank, it holds churches back. It's a significant factor why most of the established churches aren't growing in this nation. Because you see, here's what happens. When churches are founded, like when our church was founded, right? Down the road, a little ways, just a quarter mile, our church was first founded here in Glory Township. And when the Swedes all got together and they wanted to form this church, right? Many of them had come, maybe not that group particularly, but many Swedes had come seeking religious freedom. They wanted to worship freely. They wanted to be able to express themselves openly. And they weren't Lutheran, which was the church of Sweden. So they came to America and they found beautiful land like we have here that looked just like home, that they could raise families and raise crops. And and as they were starting to collect here, they said, well, we need a church because we need to tell people about Jesus and we need a place to worship. And so the idea when most churches form and when most churches start, when most churches come together is the idea is if we come together and pool our resources, we can tell more people about Jesus, right? That's why most churches are started to tell more people about Jesus. But what happens in a lot of churches is time passes. We get comfortable. We've told a few people about Jesus. We kind of fall into a rhythm. We fall into a pattern. Just like water, we take the root of least resistance, right? 
And slowly but surely, that, that desire to bring others to Christ, that, that primary idea that, that, that focused us on growing the new kingdom initially, drifts away from being this outsider focus to now becoming slowly an insider focus. And then within that environment, the me-first mentality begins to get a toehold and begins to grow. Nobody, nobody does it on purpose. But it happens in churches time and time again. And what you find then is you begin to hear more complaining than celebrating. Ever been in that church? I've been there, folks. And when that happens, it happens because we've lost our focus. We've lost our primary focus. Because people began to get focused on what they wanted rather than being focused on giving what they have. That's a dangerous place to be in and as a church. Selfism has killed many great churches. So that's a problem. One that we should all be open and honest and aware of. Another problem is consumerism, right? Consumerism is a huge problem. Not just in the church, in the world in general. I mean, you remember Jesus talking to the church at Laodicea, right? In, in Revelation. And, and he says to this church, he says, you are increased with goods and you say to yourself, I have need of nothing, right? I have no need of anything. Consumerism is a problem because it's very, very difficult to develop hearty worshipers in an affluent society. The Bible is clear about this beginning to end, that, that wealth is actually often a barrier between us and God. We, we begin to put our hope and trust in our things. My hope and trust is in my 401k, my house, my car, my kids, my wife, whatever, things of this world. And we, we put our hope and trust in those things rather than in the one who gave it. And, and again, we don't do this intentionally. We, we don't decide one day and wake up in the morning, well, you know, don't need you anymore, God. I got this stuff. But if we're not careful, that consumerism creeps into our heart. And slowly and surely, we drift away. And it really is, it, it, it's something that's a huge problem in America, right? Without question, even if you're poor in America, you're pretty affluent compared to the rest of the world, right? I mean, I can tell you statistics day after day after day. I don't need to. Just a, a few weeks back, we had our missions conference, right? And we had Pastor Martin and Ann Shikuku here from Kenya, Pastor Martin pastors a church about the same size as our church. And he has an orphanage and a school. And he has an evangelism ministry he's in charge of for his entire region, which is like being the, the state leader of evangelism. Right? And he has all these things, which is incredible and awesome. Praise the Lord. I'm glad we get to partner with them. But then... You know, part of the process of, they stayed here for a couple of weeks. Well, one night, my wife and I and son invited them over to our house to have supper with us and just get to know them better and enjoy some time together. And as I, as they were about to come, I went and picked them up. It was one of the snowing days, remember those? <laughs> they were from Kenya and had never seen snow. And, and as I'm picking them up, graciously, Tanya and Kevin had been hosting them, I pick them up and I'm driving back to my house and I'm beginning to think, you know, I'm a little embarrassed to bring them to my house. Not embarrassed because there's dust bunnies, not embarrassed because it's not clean. Like, you know, that's how us Americans get embarrassed. I'm embarrassed to bring them to my house because it's huge and full of stuff. Right? I have hot water that runs through my house. That's a deal. 
That's a big deal. In fact, my great-grandmother died at the age of 96, lived on the farm till she was 92, never had hot running water in her house in Montrose, South Dakota. It's not any different than living up here. So you can make do without hot water, but boy, I like my showers, right? I'm driving them to my house going, how am I going to explain the opulent riches that I possess? I have a clothes washing machine. I, I get my clothes dirty, right? And I stick them in a machine. Tanya and Ann had this conversation, right? Tanya and Ann went upstairs to the laundry room they've got. And they took all of Ann's and Martin's dirty clothes. And Tanya said, we'll put them in here. We'll come back in an hour and they'll be clean. Well, Ann trusts Tanya. Gives her and, 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 and the clothes they have are precious. I mean, they don't have a whole lot of wealth to have lots of extra clothes. So if this machine eats their clothes, they're not going home for a couple of months. It's going to be a problem. But she trusts Tanya. So in goes the clothes. Beep. An hour later, come up. What do you know? The clothes are clean. Right? Now, when Martin left, I... I slid him some extra cash out of my pocket and I said, Martin, we're going to give you some money from the church and there's some other stuff going on here, but here's some extra money and I would recommend when you get back, save this and start adding to it to buy yourself a clothes washing machine to bless your wife. She was amazed that this clothes machine would wash the clothes. See, she spends three hours, three different days a week, hand washing her, her husband and their children's clothes. Nine hours a week hand-washing clothes. What could this great woman of God do with nine more hours? To love on her husband, to serve her church, to be with her kids? What kind of a blessing could that be? I don't know, but I want Martin to find out. So I slipped him some extra money before he left. And said, find a way to buy your wife a washing machine. Right? And I'm bringing him over to my house going... How do I explain all the stuff that I have? I mean, I have junk piled up in my garage. I throw away stuff that, that they would find as a blessing. Right? We all do. So consumerism in, in America, it, it, it's a problem. Our, our desire to have more and better and bigger and faster... It blinds us. It distracts us from the work of the gospel. None of that is to shame you for having nice things. If God has blessed you, praise the Lord. Live in that blessing. But far too often, as I said, this consumerism creeps into our hearts and we begin to rely on those things more than the one who gave them. And that interferes with the legacy that we might leave with what we've been trusted with. Now, in this, I don't want to in any way make the church out as some sort of victim. We're going to see today that we're not victims at all. God has given us much, and some of our weakness, uh, there is no doubt, some of, some of our weaknesses is our own fault, right? Maybe not all of it, but much of it probably is. So, so those are just a couple of the problems you see, right? But the good news is we have been given a solution in the church. And what I want to do today is give you a list of images that come out of the Bible. The Bible's full of imagery. And, and I want to give you a, a list of images that are used in the New Testament that help us understand what God thinks about us and about what God has done for us and wants to do through us. Remember this now, though, as we started. God shed his own blood, to quote the Apostle Paul. God shed his own blood that we might have the church. And along with that, he did several things that we might be able to represent him in the world. And so I'm going to go through some images here. You're welcome to take notes. There's a place in your bulletins if you want to take notes as you go along here. And, and, and these are the things that God has done for the church. And, and it's what God is saying about who he has created us to be. So let's jump in with the first one, and I think you'll understand. 
The first one is simply that we are a building. And, and I'm not talking a building. This is imagery, right? One of the images that God speaks of his people of the church is as a building, which means we are a redeemed community. Now think of that in terms of its imagery. Do you remember when Solomon's temple was being built in the Old Testament, if you've studied that before? See, when they were building Solomon's temple, they had to get the rock from a quarry, right? But this was kind of an amazing building. You see, when, when the guys at the temple would say, I need a 1.3 cubit by 2.7 cubit by 4.6 cubit stone. Don't ask me what a cubit is. That's just what they used to measure. Or at least that's what Noah used. But when they said, I need something this size, right? You've all heard measure twice and cut once, right? So, so the guy says, I need this size, calls down to the quarry. And we know this quarry is a long, long ways away from the temple. Now, as they were building Solomon's temple, they would call down, they would send off, they would get these big stones. But you see, none of the work was done at the temple. They were only installed there. They would send down to the quarry, I need one of this shape, of this size, and all the cutting, all the polishing, all the finishing and everything was done at the quarry, not at the temple. You didn't hear the sound of a hammer at the temple. There was no chisels hitting stone at the temple. All of that was taking place down at the quarry. And when they brought these rocks up to build this building, this temple, and they put them together, they fit perfectly. They fit absolutely perfectly when the stones were brought to Jerusalem to build the temple. God says, I'm building a building. And he goes down into a quarry and he, and he picks up some of us sinners and he, he, he dusts us off, cleans us up, figuratively speaking, forgives us, right? And then he takes us, stones that were once broken, and he uses us to build the church, to build this building. God is building a building. And as he has brought us and dusted us off, like I said, and taken us from our sinful ways, then once we are part of that, once we are part of that temple, once we are part of that building with the imagery, then we want to help build the next level, don't we? It's not enough just to have a foundation. We want to build the next level. Well, how do we build the next level? Well, we go and find some more broken stones to bring to the Master to cut and shape and polish so that they too will perfectly fit into this building. The next image that we're given in the New Testament is that we are a body, right? We're a body. The Bible's pretty clear about that imagery. I mean, the Apostle Paul devotes two entire chapters in 1 Corinthians to the idea that we are a body. Some of us are hands, some of us are feet, ears, eyes, nose, You don't want to be some of the parts, but some of us are all the parts. We are the body. Where we're all working together. We are a unified body. We are unified in Christ. Yes, we differ vocationally. We're we're different ethnically. I mean, I'm German. Thank you for accepting me, all the Swedish Baptists in the room. My wife is Scottish. Thanks for accepting her too. Right? Our son's a mutt. <laughs> Sounds like I need that violin music like you're going to adopt a pet on TV. But yeah, we're, we're diverse. We've got ethnic diversity. We've got vocational diversity. We have economic diversity, educational diversity. We're different. And that's true of other groups as well. It's not unique to the church. But you see, the difference between, between the church and the other groups is other, other groups, as they meet together, they meet together around a common interest, right? You meet together because you're the snowmobile club. You meet together because you're the gun club. You meet together because you're the gardening club. Or, or maybe you're the lions and it's a service club. And, and, and you meet together because you, you, you share that thing in common. In the church, we meet together because we share a common life. 
It's the life of Jesus Christ. The life that's been given to us. And that's why you can go all over the world. You can go anywhere and go into a church somewhere, even a church where you may not even speak the same language as they do, yet feel a little bit like you've come home. That you will be accepted and received. That there's this level of bonding wherever you go to the church. And that's because God has said, I have made you as a body. Another image we're given is that we're a family, right? Paul says in Ephesians again that we are part of the household of God. That we should be a caring community for one another. You see, the church should be the most caring place on the planet. People, people should be able to come here to the church with their brokenness and with their needs, right? And, and when we come to church, we as the people of the church then should come as people looking for opportunities to help others so that we don't simply come here looking for ourselves, We come looking, how can I serve? How can I love? How can I give of what has been given to me to others? We don't come here saying, what's in it for me? What can I get for me? What can I take for me? Why isn't this about me? Or at least we shouldn't. We come saying, how can I encourage somebody today? How can I invest in someone else's life or family today? How can I be a blessing to someone else today? As a family, we are to be a caring community. We're a family, so we're committed to one another. But we're not a closed family. We're a family with arms wide open. You ever met that family before? That family where, like the first time you go to their house... You have refrigerator privileges, right? You know, what, you know what refrigerator privileges are? When you walk into somebody's house and you walk into their fridge and you open the doors and you can just start taking stuff out and nobody looks at you weird. So if I come over to your house today and I walk into your house and I open your fridge, are you going to look at me weird? Right? But if you've met families and I've met families that are like that, like, like the first time you walk in their house, they're like, yeah, there's the fridge, have at it. You know, you're kind of weird, but okay. And then, of course, you're in there looking, what do they got? These Baptists have beer. Right? We can joke about that. But if you've ever had that experience where somebody's been that open, what an amazing feeling. You know you're in. You know you're accepted. You know you're, you're part of that family where they trust you just to take whatever you want out of the fridge. Have at it. So we are to be a family, a caring community. Another image that we're given in the New Testament is we are to be a temple. Paul says this again in Ephesians that, that the stones that we talked about a little minute ago are, are being built together for the habitation of God. When See, when we come together as a body of believers, when we come together here at Glory Baptist Church, when, when some outsider comes in who's never been here before, what they should be able to say then is, is surely God is in this place and these people are clearly committed to worshiping Him. If, if we're doing things right, that should be abundant and apparent. And we don't want to get confused with the things of this world. The things of this world will not save us our monies and finances and all the other things, our politics and politicians, they're not going to save us. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be involved, we shouldn't be active, we shouldn't have a voice, we shouldn't have an idea of what we believe. You should. But our salvation does not lie in it. Our salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. Only one has purchased us with his blood. And so we are called to be a temple where where God can dwell. Now, each of us in the New Testament are, are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. So as, as born-again believers who follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, yes, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. But this imagery extends beyond that to the church to be a gathered temple as well. 
where God is at work doing amazing and abundant things. And, and, and when we come together as the body of believers, more can be done collectively than ever could have been done individually. We are the temple. Another image, and this is probably one of my favorite ones, is the imagery that we are to be a lamp. Right? A lighthouse. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? You going to put a basket over it? Won't let Satan blow it out? No, because I'm going to let it shine. How many of you sang that growing up? So at least I'm not the only one being silly at the moment. But we are to be a lamp, a lighthouse, radiating, showing, shining God's love into the world wherever we go, individually and collectively. And I'm going to talk more about this actually next week, in fact, I think. This is going to be the focus next week. But one of the ways that we can leave a legacy as a church together is to be a lighthouse for Jesus Christ. To stand on that as our foundation, unwavering and unapologetically. And I've said this since my first day here. I said it when you were interviewing me. I will preach Christ and Christ crucified until you get tired of me doing it or until you fire me or until Christ comes again because that's what I'm going to do. And I won't apologize. That's why I love it when Kevin does it with the kids. That's why I love it when we get to do it on Wednesday nights here with our kid ministry. That's why I I love having VBS here. We get kids from the Twin Cities coming to VBS here. We're we're having like a 200-mile impact in getting to tell people about Jesus. We are to be a lamp, folks, a lighthouse that radiates God's love, that shines God's love into the world. That is what we are to be. So how do we how do we take this then and make this then into something we can use and something we can apply? How do we how do we get from point A to point B here today, Pastor, that this becomes applicable to our lives day to day? Well, let me give you a couple of ideas and then we'll close. I think one of the first things that we as a church and every church needs to be is a church where repentance is found. Repentance. Not a word we use a lot, right? Repentance. It's not a a word that, even as a pastor, doesn't necessarily come up in my day-to-day conversations. But repentance is key if we are to be successful at the tasks that God has given us. That we, we do need to repent of our worldliness. We, we, we do need to repent at times of our consumerism. We, we do need to repent of our selfism and our me-first attitude sometimes, don't we? And, and sometimes, I mean, a lot of times. Because it's really easy to get distracted. It's really easy to take our eyes off the focus of the gospel. For each and every one of us. You know when God sends revival? If you've not studied revivals, like the Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening and, and all the different revivals that have happened in our nation and around the world, if you, if you study revival, the key to revivals happening, each and every time, each and every instance of revival, the key to revival starting was people began to take their sin seriously. They began to see their sin as a problem and collectively began to repent of it and collectively began to put that stuff behind them and focused on the gospel. And in that, then God begins to work and amazing things can happen. So I think being a repenting church is an important step. The second step that I think is important is being a sacrificing church. We need to be known as a church that is sacrificing. And I want to speak plainly at this point. I I began talking at the beginning of the message about how I think the church in America has and is continuing to lose its influence, right? That our numbers collectively, overall, are declining. And that, in many cases, I think things have been going downhill. 
I don't think you'll find many people who will argue otherwise. We become weaker. We become more absorbed with the world. And, and, and you know, the, the, the church is supposed to be like a ship, right? A ship that bobs on the ocean. A ship that stays on top of the ocean. A ship that is in the ocean. But the problem is, what happens when the ocean gets in the ship? It begins to sink. Right? When the ocean gets into the ship, it begins to go down. And so I think we need to repent because collectively, maybe not here locally, but the church as a whole has been taking on some water. And then the next step is to be a sacrificing church. To be willing to die to self. To be willing to think of others in our community before we think of ourselves first. To be willing to step out and be uncomfortable and serve others. To be able to go into our community and say, how can I love you? Even though you don't look like me, talk like me, walk like me, smell like me, or think like me. God has created you in God's image, so you are like me. How can I love you and serve you? How can I be generous to you? How can I love my neighbor as I love myself? Right? Sounds kind of biblical, doesn't it? I think Jesus might have had a couple of things to say on that subject. And if it was so important to Jesus, maybe it should be important to us too. So, Being a sacrificing church, a church that gives, when somebody receives, they go, why'd you do this? This doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't make sense to the world, because we are not of this world. We are aliens, and we do weird things according to the world. But as we continue to do those weird things, as we continue to love others, as we continue to forgive others, as we continue to serve others, as we continue to sacrifice for others and put others first, if we do that time and time again, the world will see that. And in that, the world will see God. And the world will know, at least here at Glory Baptist Church, that we are different. That's what I want us to be about, folks. That's how you leave a legacy as a church. You put others first. You prioritize the gospel. You give sacrificially, ridiculously. When people are at the least, you give them the most. That's how you change the world. And so with that, my challenge to you is find a way this week Find a way this week to love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe it's stepping out in faith and serving. Maybe it's that really uncomfortable thing and stepping out in faith and and actually having a spiritual conversation, right? We got to do that from time to time. If we don't talk about Jesus, how are they going to know about Jesus? Maybe it's giving. Maybe it's forgiving. Maybe there's somebody you just need to forgive. And it's been holding you back. And it's been holding them back. I'll let God work on your heart in that. But if we are a repenting church, if we are a sacrificially giving church, I know, I know absolutely that God is going to do amazing things. I know that if we are that church, that our greatest days are in front of us, not behind us. Nothing wrong with the days that have come. But we're going that direction and we're moving forward, folks. And when we do it right, the gates of hell will not stand. That's what I want to be part of. That's what I want you to be part of. That's what I want people to know when they say Glory Baptist Church. That's those people. They love Jesus. They give ridiculously. They serve amazingly. They're generous. They're joyous. Let us be those people. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.